Welcome to Flipping Tables, where we bring all of our religious thinking to Jesus who flips the table for his upside down kingdom. I'm Julie Sexton, and I'll be your host. Hi, friends. You're going to love today's conversation between Julie and her dear friend, Deanna. The content is so great and so rich. We do know that there were some audio issues, but we hope that you'll give us some grace and listen anyway. Enjoy. Hey friends, on this episode of Flipping Tables, I'm getting to have a conversation with one of my very favorite people in the whole world. And I know the world is pretty big, filled with incredible people, but it, when it comes to people that I know personally who inspire me and make me want to be a better human, Deanna Spangler makes my list. And I can't wait for you guys to get to know her. And um, if you already know her, then you love her. And um, I love a testimony that highlights God's redeeming love. God's redemptive work in Deanna was only really the beginning. Her life testifies to God's goodness. She is flourishing as God continues to add pages and chapters to her story. And I'm honored to be her friend and to watch her grow in freedom. So Deanna, welcome to the table. Yes, thank you. It's good to be here. I'm so glad that you made the little drive over from Wilmore. It was a little longer than you were anticipating, right? It was, yes. But it's okay. It gave me time to pray and just be and sit still at peace. Yes. Well, a car ride for a young mom like you is mm. is a safe place. Yeah. It's a nice place <laughs> to breathe and to have some, um, you know, alone time. Yes, yes. <laughs> So what do you like to do when you're in the car besides just take deep breaths? And um, Because for me, I like to listen to a podcast or I like to listen to music or I'm not a very good, um, I I lose my focus when I'm trying to pray. So I always admire people who say that they can pray while they drive. Like, that's not me. (laughs) I was actually going to say, I pray out loud when I drive. So, you know, in an age where everybody's on their phones and they're talking to something or their watch or I don't know what they're talking into, it looks no different. I'm just talking to God out loud in my car, having animated conversations. Um, And yeah, it's a really good time to pray about whatever my next step is, pray about the people around me. And I know that sounds cliche, but like, we pray without ceasing, so I just try to incorporate it. Yeah. Well, I do think that praying out loud helps. It does, yes. And again, it is because everybody is already talking on Bluetooth all the time, <laughs> so everyone just assumes. So yeah. it doesn't look strange at all anymore. So that's fun and nice. And I would love for you to just take a few minutes, because I know you will. How long do you think we've been friends? Um, I would say probably about a little over 10 years that's what I mm-hmm. was thinking. A decade. That's incredible. Yes. And we don't get to spend nearly enough time together. Yes. And we look the same. That's amazing, too. Right. Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> we do look the same. I hope so. <laughs> Especially since I just had a birthday and have more birthdays. <laughs> oh. So anyway, um, go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners. Yes. My name is Deanna Spangler, and I have the privilege of being married to my husband, Matt, who is a chaplain at a local hospital. And we've been married, it'll be seven years this year. We met in seminary, and we have two beautiful children. Um, They are twins, Carly and Abby, and they are, we call them our joy bubbles. We gave, um, I gave birth to them in 2020. And um, I was just really pleased that I got to share them with the world and every single milestone. And um, it took a village and a tribe to help me to learn what what motherhood looks like. And um, they, they, they continue to bring me joy. And hopefully I'll get to do the same for them. They seem pretty happy. Um, and we have a 75-pound dog who looks like a giant Muppet. His name is Buddy. He was our first little dependent. Oh, and he's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I love Betty. Yes. And he, he's currently at the dentist right now. At the dentist. Yes. <laughs> it's a big day for Betty. Yes. Getting those little pretty whites shined <laughs> yes. up. He's so funny. He's, he's like really dark. He's like very charcoal mm-hmm. color. And um, I always like, where are your eyes, Betty? <laughs> but um, yes, your girls are definitely joy bubbles. And I absolutely adore them. And because you have them really right before the pandemic started. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I'm so thankful that you would let me come and visit them mm. and spend time with you in your home. So I, I got to, but they really had you and Matt and, you know, the few people that you were letting come and see them. I mean, mm-hmm. they really, you guys really were like a unit, a unit. Yes. Um, Matt actually had read an article. So they were born in April of 2020 and it w- and Matt had just started his job at the hospital. So he's seeing everything like firsthand. Um, and, and I mean, he had done his internship before. So his internship to his actual first year at the hospital looked very, very different. And, um, and because of his hours, it was like, I had to invite a tribe in. I mean, I had to, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so I had just, you know, just a, a team of women who um, I, I could include in. But Matt had read an article about how um, a, a year later, or a year and a half later, when you went to see your friends again, like the people who had babies during this time who became first time parents, when you reunite with those friends, you're like different people. Like you grew that whole first year. And like nobody saw the process. You just became different people throughout that year. And um, that was a really interesting article. That is a really interesting mm-hmm. article. You may, do you guys remember where that's at? Um, Matt would. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, ask Matt because I'm curious about that. I yeah. would like to maybe read that. And we could possibly put it on our show notes. Because yes, a lot of people went through that. Like they, they became different people and their friends didn't even know them anymore. Yeah. Well, I did mention that you live in Wilmore mm-hmm. and you... I think you already said you went to Asbury, and that's where you and Matt met. Asbury Seminary, yes. Yes, and I would love for you, because I mentioned on one of our previous episodes about when the Asbury downpour Mm. was happening. About day three, I think it was on a Friday, that I texted you, Mm -hmm. and I said, hey, have you been over, and I was calling it a revival at the time, Mm -hmm. and I said, have you been over to the revival, and you texted me back, and you said, I just left, and I wanted to know everything. So can you kind of share, as having lived in this small, very small community Mm -hmm. where this unfolded, and tell us what it was like. What were your impressions of of kind of having a front row Mm -hmm. to something incredible that God was doing? Yes. Um, So I I have the pleasure of training people. I do some personal training in Wilmore. And um, and one of them um, has a membership to the university, and so I had asked the person at the front desk, you know, is the is the revival still happening? Um, because I thought like maybe I'll just take my client over there, and so we finished our workout early. You know, I got as much as I could done in forty five minutes. I got the heart rate up, did all the things, and then I was like, let's just go sit in the chapel, and. Um, when I walked in, there was maybe like seven or eight people there. And at that time, I think people had been up for like days, like just coming in and out. Um, just a really beautiful posture of people praying, sitting, being still. But when I walked in, I've had a few experiences where I feel like I felt the tangible presence of God. And it just felt warm and like like my ears were warm and my face was warm and this wasn't like a like they have the heater on kind of warm you know um and it was really cool because that week in and bible study fellowship we were studying isaiah and i want to say it's like in isaiah 61 um i might be wrong um where he's like in the throne room like he's at the throne and, and the um the cherubs or the seraphim the seraphim are like saying holy 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 and so i'm looking in this chapel and it's the words like holy unto thee or something was above there and it just felt holy and I'm like I didn't want to go anywhere else and all I could think in my spirit was better is a thousand one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere and I was like nothing else mattered and and you know and I had to go to work and like I, like like some people are really accepting of like hey you know what I'm just I'm just gonna hang out with God today but like other people are like I actually kind of need you and so I had to take that that tangible presence with me out into the world I, I had to go back into the world and just take that with me but I couldn't wait to get back um 
because what I loved about it is it was it was unforced. They didn't come announcing it. They weren't presuming anything upon it. They it was just this space that they were holding where God was moving in a tangible way. I mean, He's moving everywhere. Um, and and then when we did get to come back, uh, I really loved the speaker. Actually, I came back twice, and I could go on and on about each experience and what was different. But the third time we came back, the speaker was talking about you know don't compare your experiences um, if you're just curious about this movement of God, like that's fine. If you're coming back to God, if you're getting to know God, like wherever you're at, you know, while one person may have a tangible felt, you know, experience, another person may have a different experience, a curiosity or just an observing posture. And like all of that was welcome. And all of that was safe. And they just did a beautiful job. Um, I really love the, the leadership over there. I got to work with the president for the Office of Faith, Work, and Economics. And when I found out that he became the president of the university, I was just like, go, God. I'm like, people are going to flourish under his humble, beautiful leadership. I don't even think he introduces himself as the president. I think he just he said, yeah. Was that you that said that on your podcast? Like He's just like... Um, He's, he's just like, I, and I work for the university. And we're like, you're kind of the president, but cool. <laughs> no, the very first time I met him, that was, uh, we were there for like an orientation with our daughter, and it was mm-hmm. kind of a family mingle. And he just comes up and starts chatting. And um, someone actually had to tell me later mm-hmm. what his title was, because he d- he doesn't do that. He's so humble and so yes. gentle and so kind. And welcoming. Yes. yes. And I just, I loved that. I love yeah. that about him. And I love that this happened under his kind of watch. Yes. And Me too. So that was really exciting. And my experience was very similar to yours. I just, like, felt so close to God in that. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it is like tapping into experiences that I've had with the Lord before where I feel his presence very in very tangible ways. Mm-hmm. But to walk in there, it just felt like a warm hug. Yes. Or walking into the office of your father. <laughs> it was. When you sat down on a pew or got down on your knees, whatever your <laughs> posture was, it was like you were sitting with him. Yes. Like he was right beside you, and um, it just was so easy to walk in. I don't like to go into things late mm-hmm. or to, into things that are already in pro- progress. Mm-hmm. So that kind of... St- was a little stressful to me to like walk into something that had been happening for four days. Yes. (laughs) And I walked in and I didn't feel that at all. Like I just remember falling right into worshiping and singing and like it was just as natural as breathing. And Mm -hmm. every time that I went there, that's what it felt like. Yes. So it was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, I am really excited that that happened and you got to experience that we got to experience and it. my kids got to experience it yes i brought my girls back and like fam- like we had families we we had like blankets down and snacks and and it was hard because i came like 5 minutes before the first time they took a break cuz i mean people hadn't eaten for days they were just like full on on the lord yeah. right so like everybody kind of like took a break um, but the, but they still like made sure that the space was like sacred and and so for 2 hours i'm like okay like i I've, I've got to entertain these these two-year-olds were walking up and downstairs, and then like the music starts again, and they are on the seat. Uh, they they stand on the chairs in the back, and they've got their hands in the air. My two-year-olds got to experience like this felt presence of God and this community from all over the world, just ready to be interrupted. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, I love that. I, lo- I lo- forgot that you got to take the girls, and yes. what an incredible experience yeah. for these little girls. And all the children. It was so fun to see so Mm -hmm. many families bringing their children there. And I didn't see anybody uh, upset or distracted by kids. Like, we were all a part of it. It was all, we were all welcome. As we should be in the house of God. Yes. And I also do like that you were studying Isaiah that week. That was Mm -hmm. Isaiah 6. Oh my um, goodness! <laughs> yeah, you're fine. It's easy to do, but you were you were like in the in the right place. I really want one of those Bibles that doesn't have any addresses in it. You know, um, where it's there, there's no like chapter and verse. What, do you it's want just to scroll. Yes. Oh my goodness! I would love that. Well, try to... I like really old things, and that's really old. You want to scroll? Yes. How's your Hebrew? Yes. Oh, um, I've only done Greek actually. So I I use. Um, 
um, Blue Letter Bible to go back into like Hebrew and original language. Um, that's one of my original language tools. But we're both nerds and we like that. I do yes. remember when Matt was studying Hebrew. <laughs> yes. yes. We had conversations about that. So, um, okay, well, I would love for you to kind of just share with our listeners about your faith journey. Yes. Um, so my faith journey started actually when I was in fifth grade, I would say. And um, now I may have been baptized before that. Like, um, I don't know a lot. My mother passed when I was like 10 years old. But it sounds like we may have been baptized as babies. And I really come to understand that as, as part of God's provenient grace. And because I always knew he was with me, even though I didn't really know who he was. And that, that's a real special privilege that I've had. But in fifth grade, after my mom had passed away, I'd went to a Christian concert, and at the end, um, they had, you know, like uh, done maybe like what an altar call or something. And, you know, me and my friends, like, like we either had like dead parents, divorced parents, parents on drugs, cousins in gangs, like all this stuff. So we knew our life was a mess, but like 10 years old, we had so much pain we had already experienced in the first 10 years of our life. And we're like, yes, like, of course we want the Lord. Um, We're crying. It's emotional. And then we went right back to our lives. You know, we had no discipleship. We weren't part of a church. Um, we didn't have healthy communities surrounding us. And so without all of that, we just went back to the lives that we, we knew. So um, it wasn't until I was, I mean, but, but one thing that I knew my whole life um, was that Jesus died for me and that I was forgiven, and that I wasn't exempt from this gift. Now, you know, fast forward, I'm still involved with gangs, I'm in drugs, I'm now, um, I'm in the sex industry, um, I'm, I'm being prostituted, I'm, I'm going off into the porn industry, and I'm taking this one truth with me. Like, I have no idea whether I'm going to live or die. I, I, don't, I don't know how to get myself out of these cycles that I'm in. And, um, but I did know that Jesus died for me, and he died for you too. So I took that with me everywhere I went. And so I I would try to like save the people on the street and the people who were abusing me. And um, I'd pray for my pimp and and I'd talk to these um, you know, these these porn magazine editors and stuff and I'd I'd tell them about about Christ and all this stuff. And of course that gets like way exploited in all the wrong ways. Um, but I, I used it. I was like that, that's all I knew and I ran with it. Um, and so what I knew at that point, there came a point where I knew that I didn't know how to live my life. And I knew that I, I knew that I couldn't, but God could. And that's all I knew. And so I was reading The Purpose Driven Life, and I, um, like the first sentence is like, it's not about you. I'm like, whoa. That's really? different. Um, and because I'm like, the, like the whole reason I'm in this point of my industry journey is that like, there's a lot of attention on me. And so what does this look like? How do I get out of that spotlight and, and live that kind of way? The other thing that they had talked about in that book was making a public declaration of your faith by baptism. And so I did. I just followed the steps. Um, and I talked to my godmother and I said, you know, like, I'm still in the industry. Like, can I get baptized? Like, what do I do? And she's like, well, you don't you don't take a shower, like, before you get clean. You know, she's like, yes, go to church. Like, you, like go, to, go to the doctor. Go to the great physician. Um, and so I did. I just kept going to church and um, discovering who he was until um, – until I got to a place where I felt like I was in enough pain um, or had enough hope, both of those things had to happen, uh, to be able to leave the situation I was in. Because again, without the discipleship, I can go to church every Sunday. I still don't know how to live my life. But anyways, I ended up um, coming across a, a healing program that's in uh, in Kentucky called the Refuge for Women. And they they actually tangibly helped me to find the acceptance, significance, and security, and the safety that I was looking for my whole life. Because the reason I had made some of my choices was to have some sort of control over the abuse that I was experiencing. And I thought that was the way to go. And then to go to a refuge for women and be able to lay my head on a pillow and not have to worry about the condition of the person who's coming in my home is going to be in or who's going to enter my room that night or come banging on the door. Like, 
that was like my first real sense of feeling safe and accepted and secure. Um, even though people to the best of their ability tried in various ways, it just didn't happen until I was 28. Yeah. I love how you describe it being a safe place. And you needed a place to breathe. Mm -hmm. You needed a place to not only find freedom, but to find safety and to find a place where you could just sleep at peace. Right. And know that people were not there to get from you right um so i i love that um i love that space we love that ministry i know that you actually are serving on the board of that ministry i am i'm so excited um i i mean i've been involved in like various ways over the last 10 years and i'm still you know walking with people that went through the program long ago i get to journey with my sisters um but this is going to be a really unique way to be able to give back to, you know, I mean, there was only one place that I found 10 years ago. Like, where do you go to heal from being purchased by thousands of people, people all over the world putting their hands on you? Like, a regular drug and alcohol rehab wasn't going to help. Um, and so I am I am committed to seeing where God is at work through this ministry and other ministries like ours um, and see how we can um, set ourselves up for success and help other women find um, success in their faith journey. Well, I know that um, because we've been friends for such a long time, I know that God has flipped a lot of tables in mm. your life on this journey. And I know that you learned... Um, to live not just in for his forgiveness, mm-hmm. but to live free. Mm-hmm. So can you describe that part of your journey to us? Yes. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, again, my whole life knew that Jesus was for me. If he died for me, he died for you too. No one's exempt from this gift. And that really helps me in how I minister to people because um, like no one's excluded. So I just, I just don't see anybody as being like too evil because I was evil. I mean, the things that I experienced and did were heinous, Um, but it was at Refuge for Women. I just, you know, my mentor would say, you can't grasp his wisdom unless you grasp his love. And so I'm like, God, please help me to grasp your love because I hate the L word. I mean, the same people who would say I love you would, would torture me or abuse me or hurt me or stifle me. And so, um so I had watched The Passion of the Christ, and I, um, and you know, like there, there's different like theories on like whether that's that's a good thing, you know, because for somebody who's had trauma, you know, maybe you don't need to re-traumatize yourself. But I needed to understand what kind of like radical love this was, and I just realized that no man is ever going to love me the way that Christ does. And so I actually ended up um, getting baptized in the Southland Pond, um, in. It was 4-8 of 2012, and, and it wasn't like a salvation thing. It was just like, I now understand who it is I'm going to follow the rest of my life. And now I had this tribe in place who was going to remind me, like bridesmaids at a wedding, like why I made this commitment, point me back to that love and commitment when things start to like falter. And so I had people in place that actually showed me how to walk in freedom, how to, because when I went to the refuge, I was like, I don't want to quit anything else in my life. Like I quit smoking, I quit meth, I quit abusive relationships, I quit alcohol. I'm I'm quitting the sex industry. Like, I'm done. I just want to walk free now. And so in order to do that, I mean, there was some work that I had to do to break free. I had to co-labor with God in this recovery process and make space for him to do the work inside of me. And so now, I mean, my whole life, 28 years, I knew that I was forgiven, but I didn't know how to live a different life until I actually was accepted into a community, wasn't a project, was included as a part of. And that that life was so attractive to me, that authentic and genuine love, not rules and regulations. It was just a genuine abiding in Christ. And so I got to imitate those who were imitating Christ until I knew him well enough to be able to reflect him myself. That's beautiful. Uh, you just said that so incredibly well. I was thinking about 
um, how we take off a yoke to the world and we get in a yoke with Christ. Yeah. And his his yoke is easy and his yes. burden is light. Yes. And you've been carrying all this burden. Mm-hmm. And I think when we walk with, we try to walk with the Lord and we're only walking from a place of forgiveness, mm-hmm. but not in a freedom. Yes. It's completely different. Right. It feels completely different. And I, I see so many people and I talk to people whose stories and testimonies are nothing like yours or not even anything like mine coming out of a religious background, but to, I see them having struggles with transitioning from I'm forgiven Mm -hmm. to actually walking in Christ's love for them, walking with him. Yeah. Do you see that too? I do. Um, so, I mean, seminary was just a huge eye-opening experience. Um, one, because I wasn't uh, aware of the different denominations and traditions. And and now I've come to appreciate the many streams of faith and expressions of God. And I think they're beautiful. I used to just think it was like all this separation and all this stuff. But no, it's just like we're all reflecting God's image in different ways. Um, but my degree is in spiritual formation. And, um, and one thing that I've had had to be careful of in my own journey, especially being in recovery, is like like it's easy for me to go towards rules and regulations and the letter of the law. Um, one, because I really do have a heart to honor God. Like he is holy and he deserves everything. Um, two, though, having had such an unsafe life, these rules and regulations kind of keep me safe. Like, oh, I'm staying within these boundaries. Like I'm safe here. And so this whole experience of just being radically transformed and going from dust to dust and glory to glory and, and some days being dustier and other days being gl- more glorious, like – that um, almost discomfort of like, I actually don't know how he's going to lead me today because the things he revealed yesterday, I could go and tell somebody like, well, the scripture says this. And it's like, okay, the scripture reveals a person and it's the person of Jesus Christ. And so um, while there are things that are pretty clear in scripture, there's also a lot of context I need to take into place when it comes to my formation and the formation of others. So just telling somebody what the scripture says isn't necessarily helpful. And so how do I lay all of that down and get away from like, do this, this and this, like there are points where we need some structure. Yeah. And and the, the life is narrow. But the thing is, is there is freedom in Christ. And when you know, people say like, um, he did not give us a spirit of fear. Like, I don't see that as, like, I'm not supposed to be afraid of, like, a big bear. You know what I mean? I see that as, like, I don't have to be afraid of making a mistake with God. Like, I'm not going to treat His grace cheaply, but also, like, like I can lean in and abide with Him and trust that, like, His, His ways may be outside of my box. And so, like, going to seminary and just seeing, um, you know, the beauty in rituals, but also seeing so many many struggles that people were graduating with and then learning like I was terrified I'm like these are the future ministers of the world and and like like all of these things that I'm seeing that are really scary struggles and then I would see God pursue them maybe not life or death in a life or death way that it was with me but in this beautiful like perfecting sort of way like he knows how to get a hold of somebody and I don't have to worry about that I just get to journey with people in that formation process if they want more of him. Mm-hmm. And that's my hope is that they would desire yeah. more of God and not just be like, I don't I don't want to lose my job as a pastor, but like, how do I get rid of these things that are blocking me from, from having more of him infiltrate me? Absolutely. I, that is so important. Like we have obstacles that keep us from going deeper with God. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know one of the things I think you said was about um, just – reading the Bible to someone or having someone just read the Bible is not really enough. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a living word. And yes, we do need to read the Bible and we need to do these spiritual disciplines, but we also need to know him as the living word who resides in us, who walks with us, who wants to explain Mm -hmm. the scriptures to us, who would like to dialogue with Mm -hmm. us over the things that we're reading and learning And it reminds me when, you know, after the resurrection and he walks on the Emmaus Road with 
up to, with these disciples, and he begins to explain to them mm-hmm. what the scripture says. That's what Jesus actually wants to do with us in our lives. Yes. He wants to walk with us and explain yeah. the scriptures to us. Right. And yes. he's the only one who can really right. perfectly do that. Yes. And so we need we need people in our lives. Mm-hmm. We need um, partners, but we also really need to value and spend that time with the Lord. Right. Like I can't imagine being married to my husband and just, you know, and just reading about him each day. Like I experience life with him. I experience intimacy with him. And like, you know, I think we talked about this earlier, like like even Satan knows the scriptures. He knows the Bible. Uh, Do we? Yeah, do we? Do we know the Bible? And do we know the God being revealed in the Bible? Yes. Because I like today, I was reading um, in my reading plan. We're in Judges, not my favorite um, narratives, but uh, I was reading about Samson, and I was like, mm-hmm. you know, he's not a hero. This mm-hmm. is not. This is not. <laughs> don't look at Samson's life as a way to mm-hmm. follow the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, but so instead, I have to peel back and look for. What do I learn about God in this passage? Right. What yeah. What do I see about God in yeah. the midst of Samson's life? Yes. And so, you know, it just, there. I mean, the Lord is, I'm curious. I know you're curious. We, this is kind of natural to us, I feel mm-hmm. like. We're, we're disciples. We're yes. lifelong learners. Mm-hmm. And that's that's part of, of our pathway. Our spiritual it, pathway is probably a little more intellectual. Yeah, yeah. we like to discuss these mm-hmm. things. We, that's, that's our thing. Mm-hmm. So... Um, well, I had that experience with Jonah, and you know, like I just get so frustrated because, like, people just see like this, like, like, oh, he was like saved in a whale, and like, cool story, and I'm like, um, like he's li- like as a Christian, why would you not want? people to be saved like that that really irks me like when when we just deem somebody like too far from god um but i also might take it more personally because i was too far from god but um but then like i finally i got to the end of it and i was like i'm just like so like angry with him like and um and i got to the end i'm like wow like what that must be like to have like like the humility it must take to come to a place where like the most damning parts of your character are on display on a scroll and now forever you know like i feel like there's there's a certain amount of humility involved in that and so it kind of just like reshaped my thinking about like him as a person but i don't know yeah, I'm getting ready to do David Platt's Secret Church, which mm-hmm. is on Jonah. Oh, okay. Which is, like, very – it's different than any of the previous secret churches because we're just going to do, like, a six-hour deep dive into four chapters mm-hmm. in the Scripture. And um, I can't wait because, to me, it's – I see God's heart pursuing the outsider, mm-hmm. pe- pursuing people who were – like, Jonah didn't want mm-hmm. the Ninevites to be saved. right. He knew enough. Of, he knew God enough to know that God, was, right, would save them yes. if they turned, and yeah. He didn't want them to be saved. Yeah. And what is wrong with us mm-hmm. when we have that type of attitude? Yeah. Towards people in the world. And the beautiful thing is, is, is that God pursued Jonah too. Yes, He did. And that's what I had to learn when I came across people in the church who were very judgmental is like I just felt like God was telling me like first of all don't be don't be the prodigal son returned home who turns into the older brother against the older brothers. So good. <laughs> and so I had to really let a lot of stuff go because I was just like I like I see people out there dying all the time. I'm like what are we even arguing about here? Um and then I realized like and he's like Tiana love my church. Love my sheep. Love my flock, love my pastors, love my church. And I'm like, okay, done. And one of done. the things that I really appreciate you saying earlier in the conversation was about different denominations. Mm-hmm. And they're beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's not a competition between denominations. I feel like denominations are revealing different aspects yes. of God's character. Right. And so we need to learn to appreciate. Yeah. Especially, like, I mean, we're not talking about cults or things like that. We're talking mm-hmm. about real churches. Like, yes. someone who was raised in a cult can say things like that. <laughs> but to look at if, yeah, we may disagree on, like, little things, but those are not the important things. Right. Yeah. And so we get lost in 
things like baptism and mm-hmm. taking communion right. and some some rituals yeah. and there's a lot of beauty yeah. in rituals mm-hmm. um, yeah. that are done in the church and there's there's meaning and purpose behind right. them and so if it's you, beautiful yeah I agree yes. so I would love to. Um, how do you talk about your work? You do oh, some yes. really exciting work. So let's talk about that. <laughs> well, I work for a ministry that does some really exciting work. I'm very excited about the administrative part of it, but I'm the directive, director of operations for a ministry called The Word Is Out. And um, and I just, I, I've loved my team members. Um, but yeah, so our hope is to help people all over the world become better readers of the Bible. And so when our founder had started this ministry, you know, he realized like um, that there is a huge like problem with biblical illiteracy. Um, people know like a couple scriptures, and maybe they don't even really know how like what the scriptures are like referring to or the context of them. Um, and that's and that's all they take with them. It's like having like one little vitamin and missing all the food, you know. And um, but what we were seeing is that at the time that he had started this ministry, I think the statistics were that like. You know, Chris, Christianity is just like rapidly rising in Africa, and it's in and at the rate that it's rising, it's poised to be the epicenter of Christianity. But what happens when um, Christianity is rising in a place where we're not reading our Bibles? There isn't a seminary education, um, and synchronization is happening between like cultural beliefs and what's in the Bible. And so, um, so what we did, it, or what he has done and is is identified leaders in different countries and they come out and they get their education through Asbury Seminary in a, a method called the inductive Bible study and um, and basically it's like like letting go of all your presuppositions all your assumptions and coming to the Bible on the Bible's terms coming under the Bible not going into it with your context and your understanding but um, and so looking at things like the structural relationships, like the actual literary structural relationships. Why is something repeated? Why is something contrasted? What questions can we ask here? What is the author's intent? You know, not just like what we're receiving as the reader, um, but what was the author intending for the original audience and not just us as like the secondary audience. And then, of course, eventually like the capital A author. Um, But, you know, all of those things taking into play. And so, you know, like our hope is not to open up seminaries everywhere, but we open up international centers for biblical understanding where indigenous pastors can then train the other pastors who maybe might be doing it for vocational work and not even as like like a follower of Christ um, and people who are genuinely followers of Christ but don't have access to the same you know education that we might have here and um, yeah it's just a, a really beautiful ministry and I our director from Zambia will be here this April his family is flying in from Zambia and he is receiving the 2022 distinguished alumnus award from Asbury Seminary our founder who is in Ireland um, where he got saved um, is helping to reignite the church out there. He'll be preaching in chapel um, that Thursday. I think it's Thursday the 27th. Um, and we have just people flying in from all over. Our director, who hopes to open our next center in Myanmar, she has been um, helping people find and follow Christ authentically, um, Burmese communities like all over the U.S., and we're so grateful that we have her here temporarily until it's safe for her to go back home. And yeah, we just, and then we realized, you know, the need in the United States, like people don't know how to read their Bibles. Like what if we, instead of like teaching them our interpretation on Sundays, what if we taught them how to read the Bible so they're not relying on somebody else to interpret it for them. Oh, you mean teaching them how to feed themselves? Yes. Instead of being spoon fed? Yes. Where we yes. have to stay in the shallow we have to mm-hmm. stay shell in the shallow places. Yes. And not to go into the depths of scripture when we're right. trying to treat everybody up here. Yes. Yeah. Oh. You're speaking my language. (laughs) I want people to know how to pick up a knife and a fork Mm -hmm. and to do exactly what you described, Mm -hmm. inductive Bible study. And to want to eat. Yes, to yes. Why are we not opening our Bibles? Like we eat, we return to the fridge and the pantry how many times a day? Why are we not feeding our souls? 
Like we need to pray about this desire to actually, and I think because it's intimidating, right? So if we teach people a method that can help them come to the Bible and understand it, then then they would know more of God and want to keep knowing more of God. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree so much. You, you know, we're on the same page with that. I mm-hmm. love the local church, and um, but I love the church as the body, and yes. we need to really what can we do to make people want to study the scriptures yes. and to be self-feeders yeah. and to know how and to be in discipleship communities discussing mm-hmm. and um so i'm always trying to get people in in reading plans and um walking through plans with them to uh to do these things i you know any type of resources that i find i'm like pointing people to those resources because it's so incredibly important. I don't, um, it, it breaks my heart. And, and again, why are we not hungry? Why are we not? We're hungry. We're just eating junk food. Right. We're filling up on all the wrong things. And then like, like we're wondering like why we have this epidemic of people not sleeping and anxious and, you know, being stimulated by all these other things. And it's like, well, we're... It's, when you fill up on junk food, like who who's going to get vegetables after that? They're like, well, this satisfies, but they don't really know it's actually giving them life. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. is it is it robbing your spiritual nutrients or is it adding to your spiritual nutrients? So good, so good. I I used to have a class that I called Soul Food mm-hmm. because I was like, we need to feed our souls first. Yes, we need to learn how to open and divide the word mm-hmm. um, correctly and. Um, and to take it in. It is mm-hmm. life. Like, I don't know what time it is today, but I haven't eaten a thing. But I've read the scripture. <laughs> I've prayed. I've meditated. <laughs> I've, you know, I have, like, taken care of my soul first. I, mm-hmm. I have had coffee. <laughs> that yeah. Coffee is a, is, a, is a treat to, like, a, a hot cup of coffee and, and opening the scripture. <laughs> that goes together. Yeah. In my world, it does. Well, well, we do still need to eat, so we, uh, we, we, we are embodied spirits, so let's also feed the body. Yes, I know, I know, you, you have, um, <laughs> you do. I also me. work in nutrition, she so. Is. She does, she does work in nutrition. We can't have a spiritual ministry without a physical body, I think Andy Stanley said that. <laughs> is, is it? Okay. All right, so, yes, don't worry, I will have probably a lovely Let me style. take Julie out to lunch after this. Um, yeah, don't worry, I'll have lunch later, uh, so. Um, today, um, it has been so fun talking to you, but you know, let's talk about where we first met oh. and how we became friends because we didn't even go into that. We just, we just dove straight into the deeper mm-hmm. sides of, of your, of your life and, and stuff. So let's talk about how we became friends. Yeah. So, um, after I graduated the refuge for women, I knew that, um, that they needed to spend their time giving to somebody else what they had given to me. And so while they are forever a part of my tribe, I knew that I needed to build a community and a tribe if I was going to make it on the transitional side, you know, going from safety back into society. And so I got plugged into my local church. Um, I stayed active in my recovery program and um and i found this community called bible study fellowship and what i loved about this place is i really needed a place where i wasn't known for being in porn or known for getting out of porn and you know sometimes when when you're so excited about your new life you just share it with everybody and you know and and, and it like encourages the local church and that's really great um but i needed to like like I knew that I had a story, but I knew there was a bigger story, God's story. And I wanted to tell that story well, not just with my life, um, definitely with the whole of my life, but also like actually his story. And so what I loved about BSF was that they didn't have, um, like you weren't allowed to talk about what church you went to. I don't want to say allowed, but like we just, we didn't talk about what church we went to, what role we had in the church, if we were a believer, how long we had been a believer, like none of, it was just a bunch of women, uh, obviously I went to a men, women's group, that sat around and talked about what God was revealing to each of them in their own context with just the Bible. 
nothing else. No podcasts, no radio shows, no books, no, no church sermons, no commentaries. I mean, you like there's a point where you invite others into the conversation, yeah. but they were very jealous for you and God to have an uninterrupted conversation. And I loved that. And I felt safe there. And I wasn't somebody that was like, oh, like there's there's the girl that graduated the refuge for women. And oh, so anyways, back to how we met. Um, so they immediately put me in your group and and you were a mentor at Refuge for Women that time. I'm like, no, this isn't part of the plan. Like I really need <laughs> like a place where I have nothing to do with the Refuge for Women. I I wanted to be taken as an equal, um, as somebody who just loved the Bible. And I told them, I said, please place me in another group. And they prayed. And she's, they're like, you know, we've been praying and we all keep getting the name Julie. And could you please add that we actually never, our paths didn't cross at Refuge. No. So we didn't really knew, know each other in that context. Right. I mean, I knew that you were a mentor of right. my friend. Yes. Um, and so I, so I was like, okay, I'll trust it. Like they're getting this name and I kid you not, Julie was one of the first, like there are very pivotal points in my faith journey, um, on this side of healing. And one of them was having a friend who treated me like an equal, like you valued what I thought about the Bible. And so did, so did my mentors and everything else. But, you know, they did a lot of pouring in, in that season. Mm -hmm. And this was a very mutual relationship um, and, and all of my relationships eventually got there but um, like all of a sudden like my faith was validated and my Christ walk was validated and I wasn't somebody that um, that just needed teaching like I was somebody that like had teaching to offer and um, and so I, I kind of learned like friendship with you like just good spiritual friendship yeah and that was important instead of just like people I mentor and people who mentor me, like all of a sudden I had these spiritual friends and my mentors were also becoming friends. Yeah, that's, I'm so glad that I got to be a part of, um, of that new phase of your life. Mm -hmm. And it was a relationship that, that never ended. Like, obviously it just has kept going and going and, uh, I loved that about BSF too, because I know, I think I've shared on the podcast before that BSF was a part of my story, but I wasn't coming out of the same type of background that you had, but my background was this very religious, um, bad theology and all of these things. And I needed a safe place where I could go that I didn't have to talk about where I went to church or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. And so BSF provided that for me as well. And it helped me to make Christian friends yes, outside of the religious bubble that I had been raised in. And so it's, it's interesting, but we both kind of shared the thing, and it maybe because I understood the value of what that was like for me, mm -hmm. that it helped me to do that with you. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I loved, I think we studied Genesis together. Yes. So it was, that was a fun year. And, uh, you, it's a fun book to, to study and to talk about. And you and I love to talk about the scripture together. Mm -hmm. And so anytime that I could find someone who really wanted to talk about God and yes. what they were learning <laughs> right. in the scripture. I was like, why does anybody talk about anything else? I had to really get to a place where like I could have just regular run-of-the-mill weather daily conversation because all I wanted to talk about was the Bible. And what would happen to the two of us was we would go to breakfast mm -hmm. and then we would be there when the lunch crowd got there. Yes. Because that was before you were married. And I left hungry. Had, <laughs> before you had kids. And yes. So now I usually just pick up our food and yeah. we, we try to eat it while the kids are... <laughs> yes. Well, Actually, on they, my face. They usually eat our food too. <laughs> right. Still leave hungry. Yes. yes. I remember bringing you a smoothie and you were like, I wish Aww. I could drink this. But the girls were like, smoothie. Right. <laughs> I was like, that's my spinach. No, that's my green <laughs> smoothie. It's not yours. Yes. Um, so we obviously enjoy spending time together. And I um, am so excited because this year we get to go on a big adventure together. Yes. 
<laughs> we get to go to Israel in November together, and yes. I am overjoyed to go. Because I remember when I got back from Israel, you were one of the people who were like, you need to get down here. Yes. And you need to tell me Bring the photo album. Bring all the pictures. <laughs> and then I showed up, and you're like, you have 7,000 pictures. <laughs> I was like, yes, I do. And my kids wanted to put their fingers on all of them. And I didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> But um, that we get to go this year. So tell mm-hmm. tell our listeners what you're excited about um, mm-hmm. going to Israel and what you think this is going to add to your to your journey. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so you know, I'm an experiential learner. I'm a kinesthetic learner, and the reason, like. I, th- I think the reason why, a big reason why I, I know my Bible so well is because I experience it. I put it into practice. Like I, I incorporate it into, into what I do. And, um, you know, I went to seminary and, and got a wonderful education. But I just believe that, um, I do believe that I'm called to teach. And that could be the, you know, my children who are my disciples. I have disciples that are older than me, younger than me, not related to me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I know that I'm, I'm called to teach the Bible with oh, my clearly. life. And then I'm not really sure after afterwards what's next, but I knew that this was a next step for me. My husband knew it was a next step for me. Um, and so we just applied and I truly believe that this is going to bring my seminary education to life. Yeah. And, you know, this is my, my second year in BSF leadership. And so being able to come alongside women and um, with just the the life experience that I have, the education that I have, and then this trip that's coming next year, I just, I really think that I'm going to understand scripture on a whole new level um, and and know my God better. Um, and I just, I mean, nothing is unaffected the more that you know God. And so it may not be like a specific, like, I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go into this vocation. Like all that will come. All I know is that every single encounter I have with God is going to change the way that I encounter others who will then encounter God through me, whether they know it or not. And so like, I, I'm really excited about that process. Um, I hope to be able to teach my children well, um, and and praise God for the grace in anything in any place that I miss the mark. Oh yeah, absolutely. But um, the Bible will just come to life. Yes. And what I love about being in Israel is, from the moment you arrive, you feel like I I, I felt the tangible presence of God walking oh. with me, and you know I. The second time I got to go, I was, you know, in my room by myself and like every, like every evening, I just felt like I was just talking to the Lord so freely and just like he was moving in this space with me. And, but being in all of these places and these sites and having my eyes opened to, um, I mean, looking at the land really helps. Mm -hmm. And then you can, when you read the scripture, then you know where these places are. You've mm-hmm. been to, you've been to them, and it it just it just springs to life, and it's it's literally indescribable to me. And going with a really good guide, and we have a really good guide, um, and that is so important. But what he, he would say and does say is, uh, the Bible is your guide. Yes, and so you know the scripture. And you're going to go there, and then you're going to know him Mm -hmm. better. And I can't wait to see. I love seeing people take in these sites and have Mm -hmm. these experiences. So I can't wait to see what's going to happen. And I know it's going to be fruitful. I know Mm -hmm. because you're a person who is going to take what what you see and learn, and then you're going to apply it out. Right. The same way that you read the scripture, the the reason you went to seminary, Mm -hmm. your, your goal and your mission of discipling, your children and pouring into others. I mean, that's the something that we do. That's again why we're friends because mm-hmm. we both share that. That's the way I want to live. Yes. Everything I take in, I want to. I want to enjoy and have it nourish me, but I also want to share it mm-hmm. and nourish others. And I know right. that that's what you're going to do with this trip. You're going to flourish, and you're going to help others to flourish. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, being in a ministry and or being involved with ministries and a consultant for ministries that are trying to end human trafficking, I'm like, the goal doesn't end there. The goal is not just ending human trafficking. How do we go from human trafficking to human flourishing? And 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 that's my end goal is, is getting someone not just out and safe, but to actually live a truly flourishing life afterwards. Right. All people, the traffickers, the traffickees, like yes. all people. Yes, because it's it's whole life. Yeah. It's um, sometimes we. Uh, it's easy for sections of, of people to say, well, you know, adoption is the answer to abortion. No, that mm-hmm. is not the answer. It's part of an equation, right? But but we don't just we're not just trying to save the baby. We need to mm-hmm. care about the moms mm-hmm. and saving the moms as well. And you can apply this in just anything that you think about. It's not about just getting people in Christ. Mm-hmm. It's about teaching them to flourish in Christ. Right. Right. And I mean, going even further than that, I mean, if, um, the whole reason our founder started this ministry is like, you know, so it's really hard working for a ministry that's teaching people how to read the Bible. Not a lot of people want to want to give to a ministry like that because there's all these urgent needs out there. And we're like, if we could teach people the actual Bible, then we could actually like, like cut some of these problems off at the source because then they will actually be living according to it. Like our hope is that the more that you know Christ, the more that you will live like Christ. And and so it's like really hard, you know, for a ministry like ours that's not as sexy as some of the other topics. It's like like going even further than than all of these like political agendas and everything is like, what if we actually followed the God of the Bible? And how do we do that without teaching people how to read the Bible? Yeah, I understand that very well because when I started my nonprofit Flourish, that was kind of the thing. I'm like, I'm not rescuing people out of fill in the blank Mm -hmm. or I'm not, you know, we're not doing this, this and this. We're not meeting these tangible needs, but we're trying to meet spiritual needs in people and helping people grow in their faith. And right Mm -hmm. now going to Israel is Mm -hmm. one of the the steps that God has given us to do. Now we have lots of plans and lots of things that we want to do, but it's hard to ask people because people want to see what they're purchasing, what their their gift. Yeah. What What are the deliverables? Yes. Yes. What what is like, um, how many Bibles did you give out or how many? Right. Did you they want to quantify it. Yes. And yes. I'm like, well, we're, you know, those, the results that we're going after are going to yeah. be a lot harder to yes. measure. It's going to be the ripples that go out. And those ripples are going to continue for generations. I have two children that have not seen their mom drink, put a needle in their arm, put right. on a show God. for men. Yeah. They will, they will never know that life from me. Right. And it's like, like, how do you quantify something like that? Because the ripples of, of this next generation and then those that they're going to get to and like have a new life with, like those go beyond and beyond and beyond just the one person that got saved. Yeah. I'm trying not to cry because yeah. that's so beautiful. Yeah. Because that's what it's about. Right. Changing one life at a time. Yes. So, um, well, we could talk for hours, <laughs> okay. and we better wind Is it up. Lunch time? Um, yes, probably. So, <laughs> Julie needs to eat. Julie needs to eat. <laughs> so, I would like to um, do what we do with. This podcast is we like to close with a bright spot. So, Joanna, what is your bright spot that you would like to share? Well, um, it kind of like is all encompassing of of like almost everything that we've talked about today. And that is, I had been praying. So we moved into a new neighborhood and I was praying for neighbors and, and peers, you know, like just run of the mill peers that you could just do life with. And I have a neighbor who listened to God and she has, um, she has been a neighbor to me in every sense of the word. And, um, and she, she started a mom group and our mom's group is flourishing and like we all like like whatever different politics or styles or whatever we have like we just have this beautiful flourishing community of like 14 moms and like 20 children that I look forward to seeing every day and um, and they are actually um, she is going to throw me a fundraising party um, to help me raise the money you know twins are expensive guys expensive. Um, and, and I don't 
really want to take money from my family. Like we're trying really hard to just like provide a stable home and all that stuff. And she was just like, I'm going to throw you a party and I don't have to plan any of it. And I love throw, I love planning parties. Um, but yeah, she's going to throw me this party. And like, like women are just like donating things for the silent auction and they're going on behalf and, you know, um, sending out letters. And, um, so that's a bright spot. Another bright spot is that I get to go and speak at Scarlet Hope and um in in a couple weeks right before the derby and kind of make people aware of like some common vulnerabilities or misconceptions about human trafficking i get to sell my two books that i wrote um I should talk about my books. Um, I wrote two books. One is called Purchased, Leaving the Sex Trade. And the second book is Integrated, and that is Living Beyond the Sex Trade. And I felt like both were necessary in this day and age. One, because um, where we live in a culture where I'm either identified as a victim of human trafficking or um, these women don't need help. They choose to be in the strip clubs and they choose to prostitute. They choose to be in porn. Like I'm, I'm sitting here like, okay, um, so we're, we're out there fighting against human trafficking, but how many people are, are watching and paying for sex behind closed doors? And so my hope was, with the first book is to let people know, like, hey, when somebody chooses to, to sell their body for sex – this is what life is looking like at that point. And not, I know not all of our lives look the same, but we do have a lot of common similarities of belief systems and values and identity and all this stuff. So that first book is to help people see like, you know, like we're not just leaving the sex industry. Like there's a whole lot of rewiring that needs to be done when we get to a point where we're like, hey, I think we're ready to live a different life. Like we're done being sold. So helping people to kind of um, distinguish between like the the word choice and, and the vulnerabilities and all that stuff. And then the second topic that really just isn't talked about enough is when you come to believe in Christ, and I think this is for everybody, when you come to believe in Christ, but you have 28 experience, 28 years of experience living a different way, there's a lot of collision that's going to happen in that maturing process. And so being able to show people like, hey, this is a natural part of um, human maturing, and it is awkward, and it is messy, and we do have some different vulnerabilities than other people might have uh, according to our, our trauma or certain consequences that may, we may still live with that haven't gotten removed. So what is it look like to lean into God and lean into building friendships, going to work, creating a new lifestyle with God um, so that our brain stops operating out of the old experience and starts actually tangibly remembering the new experiences that we have. And that and that's messy and it's hard, but it's worth it. And so that's my second book. And my mentor and I wrote a piece in the second book um, for those who are like wondering, you know, on each side of the journey, like what that mentoring relationship looks like. Yeah, these are both great books. And we will put that in the show notes so that you guys know how to purchase those books. Uh, But my bright spot this week has been, I have been reading Resilient. It's a book by John Eldridge. And one of the things that I love about John is he always challenges me anytime that I read his books or, or listen to him is that to go deeper into, um, my relationship with him. Sorry, we got a little distracted. We had a little... So that's actually... Normally on Wednesdays, I'm in BSF, and that's my alarm to like wrap up the conversation and start praying. And so I didn't turn that alarm off this week. Okay. I've got to apparently learn to tell people that they can't bring their phones into the recording. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Like, like it's on airplane mode. (laughs) So anyway, my bright spot has been reading Resilient and learning how to pray into the depths of my relationship with the Lord and just to enjoy him and love Mm -hmm. him in that space. And that's what I find has been replenishing me. Mm -hmm. And so life is hard and it's messy. And there have been, you know, things in the news that have been really upsetting to me. But when I can just take these five minutes or 10 Mm -hmm. minutes and just focus on not asking God for anything, but just to pause and to take some deep breaths Mm -hmm. and focus on this wellspring of living water that's in me and to tap into that and just talk to Jesus about how much I love him and value him and appreciate him. And that has been uh, incredible. Yes. Have you read Sky Jathani's uh, With God? 
he talks about the, the the huge radical shift in going from, you know, we're either living for God or under God. And he's like, what if we lived with God? With God. What if we did things with God? You know, like we're we're still submissive, we're still serving, but we're doing it with God instead of like for, under, or, you know. Okay, well, I'm going to have to add that to my list. Yeah. So, Deanna, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yes. And as we like to say around here, keep following the table flipper and leave the table flipping to Jesus.